My 17-year-old daughter, Jenny, stopped communicating to me, a 44-year-old male last year, in the midst of my divorce processes. I had no idea why, and I even lost custody of her throughout the court proceedings because she insisted on being with her mother. My ex-wife is Cheryl, a 42-year-old female. She said that it was because she got along better with her mother than with me. But that was an outright falsehood, because Jenny had always been on my side. The switchover occurred at random and without explanation. I never got to the bottom of it because she moved out and started living with her mother shortly after the custody battle began, and she didn't talk to me much unless it was about something essential. I was heartbroken and tried several times to win her back, but she was very clear about what she wanted, to live with her mother. So, after a while, I stopped trying. After the divorce, I still had visiting privileges, but she informed me she didn't want to see me again, not after what happened to her mother. I didn't understand what she was talking about because I hadn't done anything. Cheryl cheated on me, which is why we were divorcing anyhow. So I asked her to explain, but she refused. And when I attempted to see her at Cheryl's new residence, my ex-wife informed me that I was not welcome there. So, despite having the right to visit my kid, I was unable to see her or speak to her for about a year. I considered going back and fighting for her legally, but I didn't want to subject my daughter to another court battle after she was emotionally exhausted the first time around. So I accepted my fate, even though it was bad, and said nothing, despite the fact that I was missing out on spending time with my kid. But a few days ago, Jenny eventually arrived at my house with all of her belongings, and the first thing she did was give me a great bear hug as soon as I opened the door. I didn't ask any questions, simply allowed her in because I was happy to see my only daughter after a year apart. She and I sat quietly for a time, and then she told me the truth about why she had taken Cheryl's side in the divorce and ceased contact with me despite knowing her mother had cheated on me. So allegedly, my ex-wife informed Cheryl that I was emotionally toxic and would frequently verbally attack her over little issues when Jenny wasn't present. She portrayed me as a poisonous, insecure, and generally bad person who turned off that side of myself while Jenny was present to illustrate her point. She had given Jenny a chart in which I was insisting that my wife wear a sweater to a business event, but she had not explained the context so it came out as controlling rather than concerned about what had transpired. I encouraged Cheryl to wear a sweater because it was frigid outside, and she was wearing a flimsy and thin jacket that wouldn't keep her warm enough. But she had informed Jenny that I had urged her to moderate her attire so that she didn't draw too much male attention. Then another screenshot of a chat in which I was complaining with her about how she had flirted too much with a buddy of mine right in front of me, she insisted that she was just being friendly and that I misread the situation, but I knew what I'd seen and I was very upset about it. So I'd been very rude to her in the screenshot, which Cheryl used to her advantage and made my daughter believe that she was innocent and I was the one getting upset over nothing at all. Cheryl had shown her several more chats that were entirely out of context, which was understandable after nearly nine or ten. Jenny was sure that I was the guy her mother had told her I was, rather than the guy she had known for six years. So she chose her mother's side in the divorce without giving me an opportunity to explain and tell her the truth. I was disappointed that she trusted her mother, but she was only 16 and highly impressionable. And while she had a better relationship with me earlier, she had a nice relationship with her mother as well. So I can't blame her for believing what her mother told her, especially since she had proof. Even if the proof consisted of extremely misleading texts taken out of context. Of course, she had many things to say about me that were not available in the form of texts. After telling Jenny everything, she convinced her that she had cheated on me solely because I had pushed her to do so. She'd had an affair with a co-worker, and I caught her after nearly seven months because she'd forgotten to take her phone when she went to the restroom one day. That marked the end of our marriage. Even up to that moment... Jenny was on my side, but one day Cheryl persuaded her to believe this terrible side of me, which she used to turn her against me. She successfully managed Jenny and did everything outside of court, never bringing it up in front of the lawyers for fear of being caught and revealing what she was up to. She did everything behind my back. Jenny turned over from my side to Cheryl's within a few days, and that is how she obtained custody. She didn't even have to fight very hard for it because she'd already done the job with Jenny and now my daughter did not want to live with me anymore. So, as much as I despise her, 
I have to give it to her. She played it quite cleverly. Unfortunately, Jenny had eventually caught on after over a year of not speaking to me when she overheard Cheryl talking on the phone to her cousin, who was going through a divorce, and urging her to do the same thing with her own child as she had done with Jenny. It all made sense when she overheard that, and that was it. She didn't even notify Cheryl before she returned home. She just departed, leaving only a message claiming she was spending an overnight with a friend so I wouldn't get in trouble for it. When she finished telling me everything, I informed her that she would be moving in with me, and she seemed pleased about it. She undoubtedly anticipated me to be angry because she had abandoned me without explanation for nearly a year, but I do not blame her. I blame the 42-year-old woman for taking advantage of an emotional teenager's vulnerability, especially given she was struggling to digest her parents' divorce. That was it. I called my divorce attorney and explained what was going on. I wasn't sure what I could do legally to get back at her, but then he said I might get her in trouble for purposeful parental alienation, and because I'd heard it directly from the source, it would be much easier to demonstrate that we'd need to file for full custody and amend the present custody agreement so Jenny could live with me now, which would be important in that context. I told him to start working on the documentation right away, and he accomplished just that after two days. Jenny told me that she had received multiple calls from her mother inquiring where she was because she had already called her friend's house to inquire about when the sleepover would conclude. But she was not present. So Cheryl was enraged and demanded an answer to her queries because she had already concluded that she was probably with me. I thought there was no use in hiding it from her any longer, as she'd hear from my attorney in a few days. Anyway... I called her and informed her that Jenny was now living with me and that I had overheard what she had said to her to turn her against me. When I brought it up with her, she tried to seem innocent, but I wasn't fooled. I reminded her of the out-of-contact screenshots she'd used to manipulate Jenny. I told her straight out that I was going to make sure I gained custody of Jenny right away and that she should be prepared for another legal litigation, either slander or defamation, as a result of what she accused me of doing. I was angry and didn't think twice before uttering what I said, and then Cheryl and I started screaming at one another because of something I said to her regarding another civil action. She was furious because, evidently, it was terrible enough that I was attempting to take her daughter away from her, and I had no right to sue her. Furthermore, I thought it was silly that she was complaining about it because this was the least I could do. I told her that no matter how she felt about the situation, it was going to happen, and I would make sure she paid for everything she had done to me. I hung up and didn't check my phone for hours because I didn't want to speak with her or anybody else at that point. I went for a stroll after that and left Jenny at home alone for about 30 minutes while I wandered around to cool down. When I returned home, Cheryl was waiting in the living room for me, and Jenny was seated opposite her, looking like she was about to cry. Jenny's face really bothered me because I could see she'd been yelled at by Cheryl, and after what she'd done, she had no right to speak to our kid. I freaked out at her and we got into a large yelling match when I instructed Jenny to return to her room so her mom and I could talk. The weird thing was that she wasn't even fighting with me about Jenny. She was angry with me because she thought a civil case was too expensive and she couldn't afford it anymore. After some ranting, she broke down and informed me that she had lost her job a few months before because she had broken up with the guy she had an affair with. And he told everyone about their affair, which she had kept a secret for a long time. So she was in between jobs and hurting financially. And it was a relief that Jenny had discovered the truth. So she decided to move in with me because it meant she wouldn't have to spend as much money on things. I was astounded that she was saying such things, and that her money, work, and possessions were more important to her than her own daughter. So, after her mini meltdown, I sat down with her and informed her that she was the worst mother on the earth, and that she deserved this lawsuit and everything else that followed. I then requested her to leave, which she did. But since then, she sent me a lot of texts, telling me that I'm being a jerk for suing her over something so little purely for revenge. I don't think I'm being petty, but I'm not sure. Maybe I should be a bit less, since honestly, I don't need to go out of my way to hurt her. Jenny is going to live with me now, which is exactly what I wanted all along. But I truly want Cheryl to pay. So either for suing my ex-wife now, despite the fact that she is willing to relinquish custody of our daughter after she strayed and lied to her about me. Update 1. Hello, folks. 
so I'm not going to proceed with the civil lawsuit. I read over the comments, and most folks saw nothing wrong with what I was doing. But, to be honest, I think I'd rather settle the custody dispute before pursuing legal action against my ex-wife. Revenge should not be my first priority right now. It should be about my daughter's well-being. And the less I interact with Cheryl in any manner, the better off we both will be. I instructed my attorney to drop the slander complaint, but the custody adjustment is clearly still in progress. She's already been served, and we're meeting with a mediator in a few days. My daughter has already emailed me all of the proof I need. When I asked her if she wanted her mother to have partial custody, she said no. She wanted full custody since she didn't want to meet the woman after what happened with her mother the other day. She apologized profusely for leaving me behind and never bothering to explain her behavior. Apparently, when Cheryl came over the other day, she was upset with Jenny for relocating to my apartment without informing her mother. I'd returned home only ten minutes after she arrived, and Cheryl had used that time to tell Jenny how ungrateful and selfish she'd been throughout the divorce and custody proceedings. She stated that she was not only hurting her mother, but she had also hurt me beforehand, which is correct. However, as I already stated, Cheryl was primarily to blame. She just wanted Jenny to believe it was all her fault. Because, as usual, she refused to accept responsibility, even if she was the one who made the mistake. And I am still stating it here in a much more nice and respectful manner. But Cheryl's approach to Jenny had been far more violent and vicious. I'd been married to the woman for a little more than 20 years before to this. I know she can be vicious when she wants to. And it was unexpected that she didn't spare Jenny from confronting that side of herself. I'm delighted our kid came back to me because Cheryl is clearly more concerned in trivial things than being a decent mother. So be it. Update 2. There's been an unexpected but unsurprising turn of events. Cheryl decided she wanted to give up custody of her daughter completely. It surprised me and my attorney, and we had no idea what to do when we learned about it. I had to admit that I was surprised she'd actually done it, because I'd always assumed she'd have a soft spot for Jenny. Not anymore, however. She simply wants to live independently and save money. It's strange because I know she's between jobs and all that, but being laid off at one company doesn't imply she'll never obtain another work. This is only a brief phase, therefore, I'm not sure why she'd make such a permanent decision, such as terminating her parental rights over a period of her life. Even if she had only chosen visiting privileges, she would not have had to spend much money on Jenny, with the exception of one or two weekends. Not even that, perhaps, given Jenny's clear preference to live with me rather than her mother. It's insane that she's willing to abandon her daughter, and I have a nagging suspicion that there's more to this issue than she's letting on. Cheryl worked in a well-known firm and was a department leader, so she was compensated handsomely. And three months without a job isn't going to bankrupt her or anything. She used to be a major saver as well, and unless she went out of her way to live a spendthrift lifestyle in the last year, she couldn't have squandered all of her money and ran herself into the ground. It doesn't add up, and I know she maintained her normal standard of living after our divorce, as Jenny had lived with her mother for a year and corroborated that Cheryl did not suddenly start living like a billionaire after the divorce. I have my doubts and theories, but they are all improbable for now. I'm guessing I simply have to thank my lucky stars that I get to keep full custody of Jenny without having to go through another legal battle like last year. I do not think any of us wanted it. In a way, this is beneficial to us. Strange, yes, but... Okay. Update 3. Hello, everyone. Cheryl signed away her rights today. It was emotional, tense, and unpleasant, but it's over. Jenny's been upset all day and there's not much we can do. Cheryl hugged and kissed her daughter on the forehead one final time before departing, but it was the last time she expected. I don't like Cheryl, and I certainly do not trust her, after everything she has put this family through. Even yet, she had been a vital and important part of this family for quite some time, even if she made many mistakes, it is difficult to forget the wonderful times. My kid and I both feel horrible, but we are there for one other and we will hope to get through these difficult times together. I don't know what to say anymore because, despite the fact that I'd been mentally preparing myself and Jenny for this day for a long time, I had no idea how hard it would hit us when it really came. Jenny will no longer be Cheryl's legal daughter, but... So that's how it is. I don't know what to say or how to feel about all of this, but my emotions come second right now. I'm mostly worried about Jenny. She is too young and defenseless to be dealing with all of this at her age. 
It just doesn't feel right for me. Update 4. Hello, everyone. So I have significant news for everyone who has been following our tale. And by huge news, I do not mean good news. It's so enormous that you want to shout in frustration. I met a friend today. Who? Cheryl's second cousin. We didn't learn about the link until after we began dating because Cheryl isn't particularly close to her family. She was reared by her mother, and my friend was connected to her on her father's side, who died when she was seven. Anyway, we went to high school together, so we'd been friends since before I met Cheryl. We met for lunch, and I tried not to talk about Cheryl or Jenny or the situation between the three of us, but it just came up naturally when my friend asked how I'd been doing emotionally, and I ended up telling him about the emotional whirlwind I'd been going through in the last few weeks. I hadn't discussed these issues in depth with any of my pals since they felt too personal and unpleasant to discuss. I've discussed it with my parents, but everyone understands that's not the same as talking about it with a buddy and my lawyer. He's a buddy, but he's also a lawyer, so it was difficult to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with him about these issues without devolving into a discussion about our future legal steps. So this was pretty much the first time I discussed this with a friend. And God, I'm so thankful that I did. When I told him about Cheryl giving up custody of Jenny and signing away her rights because she lost her job and wanted to save money, he became quite confused, and I had to pause to ask him why. So he informed me that the reason he inquired how I was managing with the divorce was because he had seen Cheryl's Facebook posts about vacationing on a beach with her boyfriend. He assumed that was what I would be talking about, but I had gone the opposite direction. And that's how we discovered that Cheryl had played me for a fool. Most likely, she hadn't lost her job or been dumped by her lover. It was all simply a cheap, nasty, and pathetic ploy to convince me to accept Jenny back so she could enjoy a child-free life. I couldn't believe my eyes when my friend showed me photos of herself smiling and laughing blissfully with her partner on a yacht. This is not how a broke person in between jobs would behave. I couldn't have seen those posts because I'm blocked, as is Jenny. And of course, she had cheated on me, so all of our shared acquaintances sided with me during the divorce. So they did not follow her either. But fortunately, she had forgotten to cut all ties with me, and her cousin was still on her friend list. I was disgusted when we discovered the truth, since it seemed insane that she would go to such lengths merely to avoid having to deal with Jenny's duty. If that were the case, she might have just told me about it, and I would have cheerfully accepted Jenny. But no, she wanted to portray herself as the victim, so she did something so heinous that I couldn't even bring myself to comment after seeing her post. And my companion and I sat at our table in quiet for a time, trying to digest what had happened. I tried to come up with reasons for her in my thoughts, but I couldn't. I had done plenty for her in the last six months, but I couldn't justify this conduct, not after she intentionally wounded Jenny in order to have fun. Jenny was extremely heartbroken when she handed away her parental rights, as if it weren't horrible enough. Now I see it was all a big lie that she told us to hide for herself. I don't know what to do now, especially because I know I need to tell Jenny the truth, which will crush her heart, but the girl deserves to know. Update 5. I informed my daughter the truth just a few hours ago. I'm shocked she's handling it so well, and it feels like she's grown up overnight since I told her the truth. She just shrugged it off and stated it didn't bother her anymore. She had already cut herself off from her mother on the day she departed to come back to me and apologize. Cheryl's rights were the final straw when she signed away so it doesn't matter what she does or lies to us anymore. If she really wanted to get rid of us, she should have told us the truth. Jenny would not have tried to force her way into Cheryl's life, and I would not have asked her for child support or anything. I made enough money on my own to sustain our family for quite some time before Cheryl started working, so that's it. I suppose we're not going after her or anything, we're just letting it all go. Here is the next story. My name is Danny Merlin. I'm a private eye. I live on a dilapidated sailboat in Marina del Rey, Los Angeles, and I'm broke. If I were a wizard like the other Merlin, I would conjure up a paying client right now. My previous girlfriend broke up with me because I was broke. That was six lonely and celibate months ago. As a four-year-old, my father told me bedtime stories about being a private investigator, living on a yacht called Slingshot, flying around the world and solving mysteries with my four dogs, Magnum, Matlock, McGarrett, and Mannix. I train service dogs for autistic children on weekends for free. 
I assembled my four terrible attack dogs, Matlock, McGarrett, Mannix, and Magnum. They are chihuahuas, but very aggressive chihuahuas. I call them the Wild Bunch. I nodded hello to Johanna Silver, the stunning redhead who lived on a 50-foot sailboat adjacent to my boat and occasionally aboard it. She moved into her boat slip on the same day that the verdict, a huge trawler, moved into the slip opposite from us. She had been my neighbor for about a week. Forget the Maltese Falcon. She was the stuff of my dreams. She arrived on my boat one night after a tremendous thunderstorm, crying and dressed just in a sopping wet nightgown. She was terrified by the thunder and lightning. It reminded her of the artillery bombardment she had experienced as a youngster in her native country, and it still scared her now. The first thing I saw were her long, gorgeous legs, which extended all the way up to her waist. One was actual flesh and bone. The other was a highly advanced prosthetic leg. I'd seen several women's jugs. Unfortunately, they were using the internet. Hers were the most gorgeous jugs I had ever seen up close in person. As she stood by me, I hugged and kissed her jugs, and in less than 30 seconds I was madly in love with her. She turned up the stereo to block out the thunder. Then she leaped in my bed and gave me the most passionate night of my life. I was amazed that such lovely jugs were natural in the morning. The storm had passed, as had Johanna. Thankfully, there was another thunderstorm that week. Johanna returned to my boat and me. She did not, however, leave after the storm this time. She was suddenly my girlfriend, at least in my thoughts, and I was the happiest, poorest private eye in the planet. She enjoyed singing show songs and had a lovely voice with a charming, thick southern accent. I lived in a constant Broadway performance, and I loved it. My looks were rated no higher than a five. While she was obviously a ten in my mind, I was concerned that our relationship would not survive long. Johanna occasionally had to travel for business. I suspected she had another lover, but I was too terrified to find out for sure, so I never looked into some private eye hours. I knew I'd end up like Elvis Presley in Heartbreak Hotel, if I asked her questions. Furthermore, I was terrified of the responses. Johanna and I strolled my dogs along the Venice boardwalk one morning, past stoners and a never-ending parade of druggies, drunks, deadbeats, and other misfits, including my friends and peers. In other words, the Santa Ana wind increased as garbage passed past the air blockade. A pound 300 black man wearing a green sequined suit and a green derby hat. He gave hula hoop lessons while singing along to his karaoke machine. Roadblock had a great singing voice. He occasionally erupted into opera. His near-perfect rendition was of Paul Robeson singing Old Man River. He reserved that for the very end of his show since it always brought the house down and earned him a lot of money. Johannes occasionally sang alongside him, which thrilled the audience because she sounded like Julie Andrews, but with a heavy southern accent rather than an English one. Business was slow. The audience was sparse and unenthusiastic. He yelled out to me as if we were strangers. To attract a throng, I acted like a ringer. Man, the Santa honors are killing my sinuses. He whispered to Johanna and me as she took my dogs, leashes, and roadblocks, handed me a huge hula hoop, and I did a few revolutions for the pleasure of the German and Chinese tourists. Then the hoop sank below my knees, and I fell over. I was the laughing stock but Johanna and the audience praised and commended my efforts. A wall, I whispered to the obstacle. A wall is always west of Lincoln Boulevard, which means you reside in the marina or Venice, with all that entails. We were an odd group of impoverished losers and multimillionaires that coexisted for a short time. Right, back to you, Roadblock responded, as the distinct whiff of marijuana floated over the seaside wind from Dr. Miller's storefront cannabis clinic. Again, Roadblock encouraged me to exhibit my lack of hula hoop skill, or as he put it, whoop, that's all. I was about to rotate the hoop when two gunshots rang out at Dr. Miller's marijuana clinic, ten feet from me. Turned around, two slim, shaved-headed white boys with snake tattoos and swastikas on their arms surged out of the clinic door, knocking Johanna over and plowing into me. Skinny robber, number one, wearing a Kobe t-shirt, and I collapsed to the heated pavement before I could deliver the attack command. My four chihuahuas attacked Kobe's ankles and held him down. Then Matlock lunged for his throat. He did not tear it out. He simply clamped his jaw on the guy's throat. Kobe attempted to get up, but there was a dog attached to his throat. 
two more on his ankles, one grasping his testicles. His left leg was hooked on my hula hoop, and we both toppled forward again. He dropped his nine millimeters, browning, high-powered, semi-automatic, single-action handgun, and crushed his face into the concrete pavement. The hula hoop kept me on top of him. His backpack fell tumbling to the ground. A strong blast of Santa Ana wind scooped up dozens of Ben Franklins, which whirled around like a green tornado before landing on the sand. When I reached out to break my fall, my hand landed on his rifle, which was aimed at his face. Do not shoot me, please. I give up. He shouted at me as the barrel of the revolver in my palm pressed up against his bleeding nose, and Matlock roared as he gripped the guy's throat in a vice grasp. I was more surprised than he was and had no idea what to do. I hadn't been in a fight since seventh grade when I lost. In my defense, she was a half inch taller and five pounds heavier than I was. I am not a tough guy. I gave my dogs the release command. My dogs circled Kobe and growled at him. He was more afraid of my dogs than my rifle. Roadblock slammed down the second thief with a right fist so quick that I didn't notice it move. Number two shot back about four feet, as if he had encountered a Star Trek-style force field. Johannes noticed that I had a gun on one of the robbers, so she stood over the other and jammed the barrel of a snub-nosed 0.38 Colt detective model into his face. I had no idea she was packing a gun. This woman was so full of surprises. Roadblock collected the money and freed me of Mr. John Browning's favorite 9mm. Then he handcuffed the perpetrators. The three of them entered the clinic, and I heard the two highwaymen cry in agony. I walked away swiftly. I was experiencing an adrenaline rush, better than any coffee ever prepared. For the first time in a long time, I felt positive about myself. Roadblock approached me, and I noticed blood on his green sequence suit. It was not his blood, guy. When the Santa Anas blow, things become crazy. I never considered you a tough guy. The boss expresses gratitude and wants you and your dogs to have this. Roadblock gave me $500. That would cover a lot of overdue debts. Boss, do you work for Dr. Mello? I asked. Do you believe I am singing for my health? I observed how you wrestled the thief to the ground and took his revolver. You're courageous and quick thinking. You are definitely a wall. That is why I love you, Johanna remarked, then grinned, hugged, and kissed me. This reward was superior to the Medal of Honor. I didn't want to spoil the mood, so I didn't ask why she packed a gun. I wasn't anywhere near as brave or a wall as Roadblock and Johanna thought, but I chose not to correct them. Johanna grabbed my hand and almost running. She led me back to my boat. When you aimed your gun at that guy, I was so turned on, I wanted to rip off your clothes then and there for the rest of the day and most of the night. Johanna demonstrated her appreciation of me in bed. She did things to me I had never before even imagined. Based on her moaning and screaming, she enjoyed our time together as much as I did. I was afraid this was all a dream. A wet dream. The greatest wet dream in history. But it was real. The next morning on my boat, Bandit, a three-month-old Pound 5 Chihuahua, sauntered over to Barry Jr., an eight-year-old sandy-haired autistic boy. Barry Jr. had been staring at the refrigerator in the cabin of my boat for the past five minutes. He stared at it with total concentration but without emotion. Bandit licked Barry Jr.'s face to the helmet that the child had to wear. Barry's father stared at Johanna, who stood on the deck of her boat. For a moment, they locked eyes, and I thought they knew each other. But I decided that he, like every other man, looked at Johanna just because she was beautiful. The Johanna did seem to look knowingly at Barry Jr.'s father. I guess that was understandable, since he was a handsome man. Barry's father's cell phone bust. I was angry that he hadn't shut it off because the noise might distract Barry Jr. His father was busy texting and not paying attention to his son. I peeked through the porthole and noticed Johanna texting with someone. It seemed unusual to me that they both laughed at the same time while looking at their texts. Barry Jr. turned away from the refrigerator and attempted to make sense of Bandit. Then it licked Barry Jr.'s nose. Jr. gently touched Bandit's nose with his nose. I softly touched Barry Jr.'s hand and caressed Bandit's head. Barry Jr. understood the idea and continued to pet the dog. Bandit felt secure with Barry Jr. and cuddled up in his lap. Barry Jr. felt safe with Bandit. 
For the preceding week, I had spent an hour each day holding Bandit and allowing Barry Jr. to adjust to the dog's presence. Barry Jr. did not smile, nor did he yell or hit his head against anything, his usual means of communication. For the first time in his life, Barry Jr. freely interacted with another living creature, Barry's father, Federal Judge Barry Houston Sr. tears quietly. Judge Houston hugged me so fiercely that my ribs were going to break. All the experts, all the physicians, all the time, all of the money, a lot of money, and a stinking fortune. It simply took a puppy. And someone like Danny. I'll never forget what you did for my son. This is the first time he has interacted with another live being. You saved him from the valley of the shadow of death. The judge wiped away tears in his eyes. This is the happiest day of my life since I graduated from Harvard Law School. The judge twisted the Harvard ring around his finger. My wife and I are eternally grateful. I suppose none of the physicians or scientists grew up with an autistic brother. I saw a shift in my brother after we adopted Zuma, a golden retriever. We saved Zuma, and she rescued my brother Danny. If you ever need assistance, a friend, legal guidance, or are in a jam, call me. I am a federal judge. I'm an excellent friend for a private investigator to have. Here is my cell phone number and house address. Remember, at any time of day or night, the judge's son hugged me and brought me back to reality. That hug meant everything to me. When the senior and his son departed, I saw him gaze at Johanna, who returned the look with a nod. I adore dogs, and they love me. I understand the dogs, and they understand me. I adore ladies, but I do not understand them. They are largely uninterested in me. Aside from the fact that I am short, average-looking, and broke, I believe I am an excellent match for the right woman. I am devoted, caring, compassionate, and passionately protective. When a woman wants a dog that is devoted, loving, gentle, and ferociously protective, she buys one and hires me to train him. The dog then gets to sleep on her bed, his head resting on her chest. The lucky scum blocker. I can also do it. Besides, I'm already housebroken, but with Johanna, everything had changed. I didn't understand or care why. I stopped feeling like a loser. It was another gorgeous day in Marina del Rey. Johanna Silver, my beautiful red-haired girlfriend, was sunbathing on her yacht. She waved at me as I climbed back aboard my boat. I became sidetracked and slipped on the wet swim step. My right leg slid into the water up to my knee. I cursed at my clumsiness. I dislike submersion. I pushed myself out of the water and went down to the cabin to dry off. As a rule of thumb, the more attractive the woman, the larger the boat. She would enter. Some ladies only care about the size of a guy's dock. Johanna was away on one of her secret business trips for several days. I played some Jimmy Buffett songs. I picked up my ukulele and joined Jimmy for about ten minutes. Jimmy Buffett and I performed several songs together, including Mother Ocean and One Particular Harbor. I sang the first line of Sea of Heartbreak, both inside and outside my boat. In answer, I heard Johanna's beautiful voice singing the second line. I was speechless. I didn't realize she'd returned. She continued to sing a few more bars. Ahoy, is anybody on board? The singing woman with a sexy southern accent called out, bringing me out of my tropical fantasy and back to reality. I climbed the steps leading from the galley to the cockpit to greet her. I continued to look up at her beautiful red hair, which flowed down from her head and ended at her little waist. Her body would not stop. I had to lean on the captain's chair since she made my knees weak. Darlin, you have excellent ukulele skills. I wish you could have joined me while I was singing and dancing in Vegas shortly after graduating from Harvard Law. However, before my vehicle accident, she pointed to her artificial leg. She gave me one of those southern comfort kisses, which rocked my world. She drew her shoulders back to highlight her jugs, making sure I saw them. Hell, they were all I had been thinking about for the last month. She didn't need to worry about me missing them, or the open buttons on her tight silk dress, which provided a mildly tempting glimpse of only partially hidden treasures. I wondered if she was the devil in a blue dress. I'm hoping you can help me professionally. I absolutely need to hire a private investigator who understands how to navigate a boat, she murmured in a breathy Marilyn Monroe voice. And you were clearly my man. My goodness. What? I would love to always be your man, but I knew I couldn't afford her for much longer. I'm not sure how much women's clothes costs, but I could tell her shoes, tailored outfit, and jewelry were more expensive than a Topanga townhouse. 
more than I could ever afford to get for her. She was way out of my financial range. She was the kind of Los Angeles. Jim Morrison and The Doors sung about a woman. Jim Morrison was honored on a wall just a few blocks from me. Walking past it every day warned me to be wary of a particular type of L.A. woman, this type of L.A. woman. She gave me her small puppy, a toy poodle with a bright rhinestone collar, and extended her hand so I could help her onto my boat. Her long, graceful fingers ended with gold-painted fingernails. Her hand was ethereally soft. I didn't think they'd ever done hard labor or even touched dishwater. I didn't want to let go of her hand, but I did after her dog bit my other hand. Ouch! I screamed as her dog began yapping. But Coco, she murmured, looking directly into her dog's face. He lowered his head in shame. My dogs heard the barking and ran up onto the deck from below. Magnum, Mick Garrett, Mannix, and Matlock, which I refer to as the Wild Bunch, began barking furiously. They're loud, even for chihuahuas. How was your trip? I asked. In addition to being your girlfriend, I am a divorce attorney representing a husband whose wife stole his boat. I stopped listening, she explained. She was my girlfriend. I hugged her, but she pulled away from me. First business, then pleasure, she remarked. It's a 53-foot trawler. It's called The Verdict, and it's normally docked directly across from us. She pointed to a vacant slip 100 feet away. The boat is his sole and distinct property, and I'd like to engage you to locate and return it to him. I sat on one of the cockpit's three benches. Joanna sat right next to me, virtually on top of me. Joanna rubbed my arm in a semi-provocative way. Each finger on her left hand was adorned with a separate ring with an expensive jewel, including a diamond, an emerald, a ruby, and a Harvard-class ring with a sapphire. She was costly. Most women in Los Angeles were costly. I knew she was extravagantly pricey. I mean, she lived aboard a yacht. I feared she'd eventually leave me for a wealthy man. A lot of money. You live such a fascinating life. You have an attractive appearance. You live aboard a boat. You deal with danger. The majority of the males I deal with are going through a divorce. They are whipped and beaten. They're not the type of men I can look up to. They're not like you. That is why I am with you. I grinned as I gazed deeply into her. Totally hazmat blue eyes. Joanna was the biggest liar I'd ever encountered, but I enjoyed listening to her fabulous fabrications about me while she caressed my arm. Her hand still rested on my arm. It wasn't simply my imagination. I wasn't sure what game we were playing, but I was winning. Who doesn't like being flattered and stroked? I just wish I was dumb enough to believe her. She was clearly the most intriguing woman I had ever encountered. You never discuss your cases. I've had plenty of close calls, it's simply part of the game, but I've been lucky. The tall tale I told should have made me feel uncomfortable. I would say and do everything to satisfy this woman. She knew it. To systematize an incremental capacity, I'll need to examine the ownership papers, some images of the boat and the registration numbers when it was stolen. Do you have any idea where it is? I asked, without moving my gaze away from hers. I had no notion what it meant to systematize an incremental capability, but I'd learned to use phrases like that when I didn't know the answer to a question. That gobbledygook impressed folks and forced them to submit. I thought it would have a similar effect on Johanna. You seem really efficient. Very take charge. I am convinced that you are not only a wonderful lover, but also an excellent detective. Johanna grinned at me with such passion that it ignited a fire within me. She described me as a superb lover. I could now die happily. She unlocked an expensive brown leather Gucci attaché case and handed me a file folder containing everything I had asked for, plus more. Why don't you contact the Coast Guard through the police? Because it is a civic matter. They wouldn't care. Before I start, we should talk about my charge. I began to say Johanna crossed and uncrossed her legs, exposing far more thigh than most women would like to display to a man unless she was dancing on a pole. She was not wearing panties. I appreciated the show, but I was unable to push the song. Sea of heartbreak from my mind. I eventually did, but it was replaced by everyone, someone's fool. Johanna took an envelope from Mr. Gucci, opened it, and counted out $50.100. This should cover your current expenses. I'll pay you an additional $10,000 when you return the yacht to my client. I was thrilled since I expected to receive $500 in total, but I tried not to reveal that the money would be the next back payment on my student loan. I'd gladly spend the rest on Johanna, 
The boat was taken roughly six to seven hours ago. These are the keys to the boat. I'm assuming they're going to Mexico, which is 120 miles distant. The boat can only cruise at five miles per hour. You have lots of time to catch them, so let's have fun for a while. Johanna dangled the keys in front of me, as if attempting to hypnotize me. She kissed me. She then unbuttoned her blouse. The love was tremendous. Despite my lack of trust in this woman, I lusted after her and was halfway in love with her. No, this is not true. I fell head over heels in love with her. I assumed that was her plan. I had no idea why, nor did I care. My intellect warned me from the moment I met her that she was trouble. But I didn't care. For a brief moment, blood returned to my brain and I realized she wasn't just trouble, she was dangerous. Then she brushed my thighs against the blood again. I stopped thinking after leaving my brain. After two more rounds, she stated I really needed it. Here is my card. When you find the boat, please contact me at any time of day or night using my cell number. There was only one battery bar displayed. I'd have to remember to charge it when I retrieve your boat. Where would you like me to take it? I asked. I admire your confidence. Johanna wrote her address on the back of her card. This is a house in Long Beach's Belmont Shore neighborhood with a boat dock in the backyard. I'm guessing his wife is taking the boat to Mexico, so don't spend any time. Johanna shook my hand goodbye with a strong squeeze after we had finished with the boat business. We should cruise to Santa Barbara for a romantic weekend. But first, you must find this boat. I nodded my head. Yes. Johanna drew back her shoulders and thrust out her chest. She utilized her jugs as a weapon of mass destruction, and no straight man was immune. It seemed as if they were two Star Trek phasers ready to stun or even kill. She smiled as she gazed down at my crotch, knowing she had succeeded. I couldn't control myself. I wrapped my arms around her and kissed her. Johanna wrapped her arms around me, placed her jugs on my chest, pressed her good knee between my legs, and gave me the sweetest kiss of my life stroking the back of my neck with her delicate fingertips and her tongue against mine. I wish we had more time, but the boat is sailing away, and you'll need to get started right away if you want to find it. I need to leave now. That was the moment my brain sent an emergency message to my heart. Danger. Do not be an idiot. Run away. But the phone line to my heart was busy, so the message went to voicemail. Thank you, Lord, I said to myself as I assisted her off my boat and onto the dock. My legs were wobbly, so I supported myself against the deck table and watched her walk away. She had a wonderful walk. Why would a woman this attractive date me, let alone declare she loved me? I'm not Thomas Magnum. To be honest, I believe I would be an excellent catch for a woman. But I also know that a woman as attractive as Johanna would disagree with my evaluation. She was definitely playing me, but it was completely needless. Was her physique and $5,000 motivation enough? There was obviously more to this situation than she informed me about. She was trying way too hard. She not only turned me on, but she also triggered all of my psychological alarms. But I didn't care. She was the tempting conductor, leading me down the tracks. And I was powerless to get off the rushing train before it reached its destination, which was almost certainly Margaritaville or worse. I read all of the paperwork Johanna had given me. The boat was owned by the Verdict Corporation, which did not tell me anything. It was difficult for me to concentrate since all I could think about was Johanna. I figured the boat wasn't the husband's entire and distinct property. It was likely community property, and both spouses were battling dirty to maintain it. I also discovered a solution to the challenge of finding the boat. The boat has an ACE identification number and a transmitter. AIR stood for Automatic Identification System. The boat sent its location, course, and speed to satellites and nearby ships. I have a portable receiver on my boat. I burst out laughing in less than three seconds. The ship's location appeared on the screen. It was traveling south just past Long Beach at six miles per hour, about three miles offshore. I hoisted my inflatable boat, which had an electric engine, out of the water and floated alongside my boat. Slingshot moved it into the garage with the assistance of two dock workers and into the back of my pickup. I also have the fish tracker and a few more gadgets that could come in handy for this adventure. My vehicle was filthy. I really needed to wash, and now I've got some money. I climbed beneath the car to remove the cardboard I'd placed there to catch dripping oil. I noticed handprints around the bottom of the passenger door, above the cardboard. 
Something was duct-taped to the frame. I slid beneath the car, removed a little electrical gadget called a GPS tracker, and placed it in my pocket. As I backed out of the garage, I observed a man in an illegally parked white Ford Mustang 5.0 following me. I made a few bends in the automobile and stayed behind me. The Sting was more faster than my 4X4. I drove into the nearest packed retail area, waiting for someone to drive out of a space with two other cars vying for it. I jumped to the front and let them block the aisle. I exited the retail area with my tail still locked behind the two competing vehicles. I assumed the tail worked for the wife's counsel and was directed to me by the husband's lawyer. These people were quite crafty, but so did I. I stopped at a gas station a few blocks away and placed the GPS tracker into the back of another pickup truck. Five minutes later, I was driving south on the 405. There weren't many harbors where the vessel could stop for fuel before reaching Mexico. Huntington Harbor, Newport Beach, Dana Point, Oceanside, and San Diego. As I turned off PCH, Pacific Coast Highway, in Huntington Beach, I checked my handheld device for air. The verdict was delivered inside the Newport Beach Channel. I noticed the boat's final coordinates and attempted to call Johanna, but my phone's battery failed. I kept thinking of Johanna. She wasn't merely a daydream. She was becoming my obsession. I hurried along PCH for another ten miles before entering Newport Beach. I'm not sure if it was the caffeine in the McDonald's coffee or thinking about Johanna, but I was quite thrilled about the work. I was about to commandeer a boat. I would be a pirate, corsair, or buccaneer. This would be the coolest thing I had ever done. Johanna would adore me forever. I drove to Harbor Island but couldn't find a parking spot, so I went to Linda Island and parked about a mile away from my quarry, which was anchored on Lido Island. I can never remember the names of those two islands. I manhandled my inflatable boat 30 feet to the dock, which listed only four Linda Island Club members. I made another journey to get the electric motor. I felt depressed. I saw the treasure boat on Lido Island, which is California's version of Fantasy Island. A mansion on Lido Island was worth more than all of Long John Silver's riches from Treasure Island. It is where Jesus would reside if Jews and other non-blondes were allowed. The boat was not named. What's the verdict? The stern was painted with the name Hispaniola. That was the name of the ship in the novel Treasure Island. She was a stunning Grand Banks trawler with plenty of varnished wood. She drifted behind a massive mansion, possibly 10 or 15,000 square feet with a massive yard. A mansion that large with a lot that big on the main channel must be worth more than $50 million. What must you do to earn that type of money? That's a lot of golden doubloons. I suppose you have to be a pirate to afford that kind of place. The boat was docked again, with the stern out in the channel. A huge sailing vessel about 40 feet long touched its port side. A smaller sailboat was next to it on the starboard side. Two men sat at the bow on deck chairs, smoking cigars and drinking beer. They just sat there. I suppose they were guarding the boat. I touched the name painted on the stern and discovered that it was completely wet, which came as no surprise. They presumably painted on the new name less than ten minutes ago. I waved as I drove by, but they ignored me. I had to smoke bombs like the ones I used to hide behind when I appeared or disappeared on stage during my magic show. I put them into the stern cockpit while misdirecting the two guards' attention to the sailboat tied next to them by claiming the dock lines were loose. I kept driving away. A minute later, a massive volume of smoke miraculously erupted from the stern. I was already on my way back when I cried, Fire! The two cigar smokers were surprised and perplexed. Get off the boat before it explodes! I shrieked in faux panic. Untie it from the dock, so the other boats in the house do not catch fire. I'll pull it out into the channel. With that, I secured a rope from my inflatable to the port aft cleat. The crew loosened the mooring lines, and I directed the boat about twenty feet away from the dock into the canal, which was obscured by thick smoke. I agreed to the ruling and went on board, ran below, inserted the keys into the ignition, ran topside, started the engines, and sped away from the dock. Art, matey, I responded, for I had just stolen a boat and was a real-life pirate, a buccaneer like Captain Kidd, John Lafitte, or Jim Hawkins from Treasure Island. I laughed my head off until the guards understood what had happened and began shooting firearms at me. The sound indicated that they were. 357, 4.4, 4 magnums, and 2 slugs, 
which broke the windshield inches above my head. I ducked. This caper was no longer amusing. Then I remembered they executed pirates. This was certainly not a typical divorce case, but I didn't have time to sort that out now. The smoke still veiled me, but not for much longer. I pushed the twin throttles forward, but instead of increasing speed, the engines died. Shiver me timbers. I was about 200 feet from the house, drifting toward a small, sandy beach. One guard went into the water and swam after me. The other attempted to untie one of the sailboats. I needed to think quickly. The boat began fast, so it couldn't have been the batteries. The fuel gauge indicated more than half a tank. There has to be an issue with the fuel delivery system. The swimmer mounted the swim platform and attempted to climb over it while clutching the pistol. There was no cutlass handy, so I grabbed a bottle of Heineken and smashed it into the scurvy dog's right hand. He shouted as he released the rifle, and I jabbed him in the chest with my right foot before pushing him back into the water. The blood swirled around his right palm in the water. I bought myself another twenty seconds at most. I opened the fuel line cabinet and discovered that both valves had been turned off. I quickly moved them to the on position and restarted the engines. They fired right away, and I pushed the throttles to the limit and sped away. Just as the swimming guard was ready to approach the swim step, I turned around the ocean side of the island and threw the still-burning smoke grenades overboard. I also turned off the aircraft transponder. I was not going to let them discover me in the same way that I found them. The natural option would be for me to proceed down the main channel of the sea. This is what the guards would expect. That is what my employer would anticipate. That's where everyone would be looking. This trawler swims well, but she is far too slow to outrun anything faster than a kayak. I would have to thank them. I headed towards the back bay and drove to the far side of Lindale. I tied up to a pier behind a home with a for-sale sign, with the stern facing the house, like a slew of other identical Grand Banks trawlers in Newport Bay. If the bad guys were cruising after me, they would not notice the boat's name on the stern. That might give me an extra minute while they come ashore to inspect it. I needed every second I could get. Driving straight across Newport Bay took me less than five minutes. Driving there meant driving all the way around the bay, which would take the bad guys at least 30 minutes, even if they knew where I was and had to check this side of the bay. It may take a few hours unless they got lucky or clever and ran the two-block width of Lido Island to observe where I was going down below. Everything appeared normal. I anticipated to find bits of eight scattered around. The huge beds were carefully prepared, and each had decorative pillows. I grabbed a knife from the kitchen and ripped one of the pillows. I was expecting to find narcotics, but there was simply foam inside. I removed the blankets from the king-sized bed in the main stateroom and crew quarters and noticed that they'd just covered the mattresses. Three enormous vintage Gucci steamer trunks occupied the entire guest cabin. I ripped them open and saw that the steamer trunks contained no doubloons or pieces of eight, but rather piles upon stacks of hundred-dollar bills. I counted one stack and concluded that the boat contained millions of dollars in greenbacks. I felt both thrilled and terrified. I was unarmed, and I was fully aware that if those people found me, they would kill me to reclaim this pirate-worthy prize. While pretending to be a pirate, I encountered real-life buccaneers. Who wouldn't want me to share this treasure? And dead men don't tell tales. I wanted to contact the local police, but I wasn't sure I could trust them. I also knew they'd arrest me for stealing the boat. When I showed them the money, things became quite complex. I may be assassinated in jail by the bad guy's accomplices or my own client. I cleaned my fingerprints off everything I touched. I pulled a huge circuit breaker from a panel behind and beneath the ignition and placed it in my pocket. This boat was heading nowhere, now that I've deactivated the ignition. I opened my wallet and went through the two business cards I'd received today. Clearly, if I called my client or girlfriend Johanna, she would murder me. I also understood that even if she would not kill me, which seemed doubtful, she would never pay me. I recognized that she did not love me. She simply stayed on my boat with me to keep a closer check on the treasure boat docked across from mine. I couldn't find a bag, so I loaded my pockets, shirt, and even undies with $100 banknotes. At the very least, I would die affluent. I was running out of alternatives. The individuals who shot at me could be only seconds away from me now. I had no way to know. If I became greedy and attempted to make multiple trips between the boat and my automobile, 
I would very likely die before spending the money. I was sweating, and I shivered. My hands trembled. For warmth, I put on the Red Sox hoodie and hat that were on the captain's chair. I saw Judge Barry Houston's second business card in my wallet. Hallelujah. I stepped into my attached dingy and motored 2,000 feet to the boat club, where I pulled the inflatable back to safety in my car. I started the car and drove gently away so as not to draw notice. As I drove, I emptied my pockets, jeans, and ran out of cash. I stored the wet cash in a Whole Foods shopping bag under my seat. I stopped at McDonald's on PCH for another Big Mac and coffee, as well as a phone call with Judge Barry Houston. He was one of the few people I could rely on, even if he wasn't a wall. I felt extremely fortunate to have him in my corner. I attempted to call Judge Houston from my cell phone, but the battery had died. I found a payphone and told him about the money I found. I gave him the addresses of the house on Lido Island, where I stole the boat, and the one on Harbor Island, where I parked it. He claimed he'd call the FBI to pick up the boat and raid the residence. I felt fairly fine. He told me not to return to my boat because I would be unsafe there. He generously offered to let me stay at his home for the night. He also told me not to tell anyone what had happened for their own protection, and not to park in front of his house, but rather several blocks away. He also urged me not to walk straight to his house, but to go several blocks in the opposite direction to ensure that no one was following me. If I parked north of his house and walked around the block, approaching his house from the south with my hat pulled down and obscuring my face because most of the homes in his neighborhood had ring cameras, he was quite aware of these things. As I drove back to Los Angeles, I realized that I had wrongly told Judge Houston that I docked the boat at Harbor Island when it was actually on Lindale. I tried to relax by singing a bunch of Jimmy Buffett songs. After all, I was a real pirate. I drove into Hancock Park, a very Tony old money enclave with pre. World War II houses. A federal judgeship must pay handsomely. It was located close to the co-anchor past the flight route, in a low position between the mountains that separated Los Angeles. Basin from the San Fernando Valley. The Hollywood Freeway passed across it on both the ground and above. It was a popular route for flying between the basin and the valley. The noise was continuous and overwhelming. As directed, I took a winding path from my car to the judge's opulent home. I had my face covered in the Red Sox helmet and hoodie, looking down at the pavement rather than where I was going. I walked into a white panel van parked in a driveway, blocking the walkway a few homes down from the judge's home. As I walked up the flagstone walkway to the judge's front door, I noticed security cameras recording me. My Red Sox hat and hoodie shielded my face from the cameras. The judge opened the door while wearing a very wet swimming suit and a bathrobe. The house was dark and dreary. The dark mahogany walls made the house look more like a mortuary. As I stepped in, I was about to explain the boat's correct location. Judge Houston, we have an issue. I was immediately attacked by a toy poodle wearing a red rhinestone collar. Coco was Johannes Silva's toy poodle. What the heck was her dog doing there? Johanna arrived in a wet, tight, revealing bathing suit with a massive 38-inch breast with a large 0.38 caliber handgun before I could react or figure out what had happened. All of them were aimed at me. Her jars may still have been set to stun, but the .38 revolver was plainly designed to kill. She carefully patted me down for a gun all over my body and between my legs. Danny, I'm flattered that you were glad to see me. So your affection was all an act? I spoke with a sad heart. It was not an act. I stayed on your boat to keep a closer check on them. Let us call it our treasure boat. But I thought you were cute. And I truly enjoyed our time together. But money is money. Business is business. Why did you have to search the boat for our money, Danny? You've complicated everything. I did not realize you were a Red Sox fan. I became one while attending Harvard University in Boston, the judge explained while kissing the back of Johanna's neck. What does your wife think of you and Johanna? I asked the judge. She is out of town with her son, so Johanna must remain exiled on your yacht this weekend. Do not worry. I am not jealous of you or Johanna. We maintain an open relationship. Marry again. Kiss the back of Johanna's neck. Fear and jealousy consumed my emotions. Her hands caressing my crotch would have been the highlight of my month, if not for her gun touching my skull. I knew Thomas Magnum would take the rifle from her and sneak a kiss without being shot, but I wasn't sure how. I suppose I should start practicing it if I survived the evening. She motioned me to follow her. 
We walked out to the hot tub, where I recognized a Los Angeles County Deputy Assistant Sheriff and an Assistant United States Attorney with a pockmarked face among the bubbles. I had always looked up to folks like this. I was grieved rather than startled by their corruption. They watched Monday Night Football on a big-screen TV next to the in-ground hot tub. The TV was improvised on a glass table that was slightly too small to accommodate such a large TV. A few feet away was a large built-in stone barbecue topped with steaks. They smelled great. I wondered if I'd get a steak for my final meal. Johanna joined the judge, and still pointing the gun at me, they entered the hot tub. The cold night air did wonders for her ducks. Joanna, could you please not point the gun at me? If you slip while using the hot tub, it may accidentally go off. Danny, I saw you tackle the gunman in Venice. I know how fast you can move, so no, the gun remains pointed at you. If I wasn't so scared, I'd be flattered. I thought the judge spoke in a low, calm voice. Danny, we are all extremely impressed with you. You shook our man in the marina who was following you. You found our GPS tracker in your car and disposed of it again. You were very clever. Taking out the battery from your cell phone was very professional and earned our respect. You found my boat quickly. But Danny, you've been a bad boy. You led us on a wild goose chase for the boat. Our man couldn't find it. It wasn't where you said it was. You've stolen our boat and we want it back. It's not docked on Harbor Island. Where is it? It's anchored off Gilligan's Island, I answered. Joanna rose from the hot tub and slapped me hard across my face. I rubbed my face. It's darker. Fantasy Island. Just like the love you claimed you had for me. Don't act cute with us, Johanna said as she slapped me across the other side of my face just as hard as the first slap. Joanna, that wasn't called for. I'm sorry, Danny. Where is my boat? Mary shook his head. Joanna sat back in the hot tub. At first, I couldn't think of a thing to say. Judge, you told me how eternally grateful you were to me for the help I gave your son. Why did you do this to me? I'm truly sorry, but we were in a hurry, and you were the only person I knew who could operate and navigate a boat. And, well, business is business, the judge answered. And because you're a natural-born patsy, the assistant U.S. attorney added, the guards on the boat tried to kill me. It was a risk we were willing to take. The assistant U.S. Attorney General smirked. You didn't plan this very well. How would you recover your money if I was dead? That's why we had a man following you. Johanna shrugged his shoulders. He was there to protect you when you ditched him. You outsmarted yourself. I don't believe you. As soon as I docked the boat in Long Beach, he would have killed me. And now you're going to kill me. We aren't going to kill you. The judge paused if we don't have to. You and I are much alike. You're a buccaneer. We're barristers. It's the same thing. Tell us where you've hidden the boat and we'll pay you $50,000. You'll become part of our group. We can use a bright young man like you. You needn't worry. In fact, there's a bottle of empty gay rum on the table. Why don't you pour yourself a glass and relax a little? I thought of Robert Louis Stevenson book, Treasure Island. Fifteen men on the dead man's chest. Yo, ho, ho. And a bottle of rum drink and the devil had done for the rest. Yo, ho, ho, and a bottle of rum. I refused the rum. I needed all my wits about me. I was fighting for my life against Harvard graduates. It was time to use all the fighting skills my dad had taught me growing up as one of the shortest kids on the dangerous streets of Venice. When you're in trouble, don't use your fists. Don't use your feet. Use your brain. Think fast and talk your way out of it. And as a short, skinny child, I had many times, I swear that my IQ instantly jumped by 20 points. Inspired by my father's advice and my childhood experiences with my newly found self-confidence, I ridiculed my captors. Please spare me the bullshit. Do you think I came here without insurance? Didn't you think I'd have a plan B? I'm not worried. I have the situation under control and you're all screwed. Did you tell anyone about any of this? Ask the gray-haired sheriff. Are you willing to bet your lives that I didn't? It was my turn to taunt them. Danny, did you tell anyone? Demanded the judge. I said nothing. I couldn't decide which answer might save my life. Damn, screamed the assistant U.S. attorney as one of the football teams scored a touchdown. You owe me $1,000, responded the federal judge with a hearty laugh. See, Danny, we're all just friends here. Despite his protestation of friendship, Johanna never took her gun off me. She held the judge's hand with her other hand. 
If she didn't shoot me, I would probably die of a broken, jealous heart. The government doesn't pay us very much. Judges haven't had a raise in almost ten years. We all have to moonlight a bit by selling drugs, I asked. Shame on you for even thinking that, the sheriff answered. None of us touches drugs. We are drug runners. When we find drugs, we destroy them. We just confiscate their money. Think of us as crime-fighting vigilantes, Johanna said, without a trace of irony or sarcasm, who also profit by our good deeds. We call ourselves the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the sheriff added. If you fancy yourselves the Holy Trinity, then you must be Judas Iscariot, I pointed at Johanna. Danny, one way or another you are going to tell us where the boat is? Johanna said, tell us now. I really like you. Don't make me hurt you. Johanna, the gun at my shaking left knee. I looked at the steaks on the barbecue as I too was getting grilled. I also saw that the pool area was covered by security cameras. Calm down, Johanna. Reason? Judge Houston, there's no need for threats. Danny is a reasonable person. We're all reasonable people. Danny, you must forgive Johanna. You know what they say about redheads and their tempers. I know we can work this out before we have to become impolite and perhaps worse. I looked at their hands. Each one wore a Harvard class like the one the judge wore. I want to thank you all for confessing on tape. I'll get a substantial reward. The FBI has been on to you for a while. They followed Johanna to Mai and spoke with me after she left. Do you think a patsy like me was able to lose your man and steal the boat all by myself without their help? The reason your man didn't find the boat is because the FBI has it. Do you all want to go down for murder? They're listening to every word we're saying. They've recorded your confessions. They call you the Harvard Mafia. I don't believe him. Johanna shook her head. He's bluffing. See how he's shaking? I always shake when I'm holding the winning hand. It's my tell. How would the city it know that we all went to Harvard? We should have been more careful. The deputy shook his head. The FBI hacked into your security system. All those cameras are feeding straight to them. If you kill me, those cameras will convict you. That system hasn't worked in weeks. Try to get a workman to show up in L.A. It's impossible. The judge laughed. That's what the FBI wants you to think. There's a white FBI panel van parked across the street. Go look in. My mug is on the security system of each of your neighbors. I didn't follow your directions to cover my face. The judge said as he poured himself tequila from a bottle next to the hot tub. One of the endless stream of helicopters flew overhead. I waved both of my hands towards it. I want you to stop screwing around with me, and now I'm going to stop screwing around with you. That's an FBI helicopter. Your game is over. Johanna, hand me the gun. Slowly. But first, if you all walk outside with me right now with your hands behind your heads, it will go better for you. Bullshit, the judge said in a most injudicious manner. What if he is wearing a wire? The nervous assistant U.S. attorney asked. I removed the boat ignition circuit breaker from my pocket and held it up to them. Special Agent Monroe, I'm bringing the perps out front. Don't shoot. That's not a wire. It's a circuit breaker. Let me see it, the sheriff said upon the circuit breaker and made it disappear. But he could still have a wire, the sheriff said. Good point, replied Joanna. Merlin, take off your clothes ordered the woman with whom I previously wanted to spend the rest of my life naked. Now, of course, it looked like I would be dead within the hour, and my wish to spend the rest of my life with her would, in some perverse way, come true. They called my bluff. So much for poker. Damn, my knees were shaking so hard I could have been dancing the Charleston. I was off balance to begin with. I was so scared. I tried to take off my jeans without first removing my shoes, Dollar 100 bill fell out of my pants. Kick it hard for that field goal, screamed the sheriff. The TV. The ball sailed through the air. Is that our money? Demanded the woman of my dreams as she put one arm around the judge. I was now filled more with jealousy and rage than fear. I was flustered. I tripped and fell against the giant 70-inch TV, precariously perched on a glass table as it began to fall on the ground. I subconsciously knew this was my one chance to survive and also my one chance to get my revenge on Johanna without a conscious thought. I kicked the TV right into the pool. I scored a Super Bowl game winning touchdown. Sparks flew out of the back of the TV as it electrocuted. My screaming would be executioners. All of Johanna's muscles contracted, including her trigger finger. She shot the sheriff as she looked at me and her pleading, I screamed, 
Help me. It was her life for mine. If I saved her, she'd still kill me. I didn't care. I loved her. And I tried to reach over to her. But she was by now, in the middle of the hot tub, violently shaking, and I couldn't reach her without jumping in and dying with her. I started screaming in frustration. Damn it, I warned you not to mess with me, but I couldn't stop crying. I chose self-preservation and will probably hate myself forever because of it. Houston may have been a judge, but that day, I was the jury, and the sentence was death by electrocution. They didn't die immediately. It took almost 30 seconds until the all the four horsemen of the apocalypse slid under the water while still convulsing. I pulled up my pants and picked up my money. I want my fingerprints from everything I touched, including the doorbell. Then I left again. I covered my face with my stolen Red Sox hat, hoodie, and sunglasses while I slowly walked out of the house and back to my car. I looked straight down at the ground the whole time because who knew how many of these houses had security cameras. I was so filled with anger, hatred, sorrow, regret, jealousy, and love for Johanna that I couldn't process all of my feelings. I was happy to still be alive, but I cried as I walked and sang the Jimmy Ruffin song, What Becomes of the Brokenhearted. I walked in the opposite direction of my car for several blocks and then made several right turns in case the police canvassed the neighbor's security cameras. I guess that's why the judge didn't want me parked in front of his house. The thought of possessing the millions of dollars on the boat was tempting. The judge had a man still looking for the boat, and by now, the guys in Newport from whom I seized the boat. Must have figured out that I didn't go out to sea. That meant they would search all the possible places in Newport where I could have stashed the boat. There weren't that many. They must be closing in on the boat's location by now. A few minutes later and a few miles away, I found a Spanish-speaking man who understood no English, speaking on his cell phone. I covered my face with my hat, hoodie, and large sunglasses. I wiped my fingerprints from the toe that I gave him. I dialed the FBI from his cell phone. I left my prints from his phone as he read from a paper that I gave him. He informed the FBI of the location of the boat and drop house. He had no idea what he was saying. Then I had him repeat it all to the Secret Service and the Newport Beach Police. Maybe the three agencies would keep each other honest. Maybe not. I drove aimlessly for the next few hours. Then news on the car radio reported a shootout on a boat in Newport Beach between the FBI and alleged drug smugglers over millions of dollars. I cried as I drove back to boat. Joanna was an angel who I loved with all my heart. Since the first morning I saw her, but I killed her. Finally, after hours of crying, I realized and accepted the heartbreaking truth. Joanna wasn't my angel of the morning, but I was her angel of death, sending loads of love to Ronald Burns for his contribution. Thank you for taking the time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed the article, please like and subscribe if you have not already. If you have a story to offer about your own or someone else's situation, please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care.